An Introduction to the Book of Genesis Genesis was completed by Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in 1513 BCE. Born in 1593 BCE, Moses was a prophet, leader, judge, historian, and mediator. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, called the Pentateuch, as well as Job, Psalm 90, and possibly Psalm 91. The name Genesis means origin or birth. The book explains the origin of the universe and how God prepared the earth for people to live on it. The account also describes the origin of the Israelites and their growth in Egypt until the death of Joseph in 1657 BCE. Genesis has 50 chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 outline how God, in six periods called days, prepared the earth for humans and then created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. They were to fill the earth and subdue it, and they had the prospect of everlasting life. In chapter 3, Eve is tempted by a serpent to disobey God. Adam joins her in disobedience, bringing sin and death into the human family. In chapter 6, wicked angels materialize and take women as wives, producing hybrid offspring called Nephilim. Wickedness abounds, and God decides to put an end to all flesh by means of a great flood. Noah, however, has found favor with God, who tells him to build an ark to save his family and the various kinds of animals. In chapters 10 and 11, we read that after the flood, people start to build a city with a great tower, thus defying God's purpose for humans to fill the earth. But God confuses their language, scattering them. Chapters 11 to 25 focus on Abraham, a man of faith. In chapter 12, Jehovah tells Abraham, then called Abram, to enter the land where he would one day become a great nation, and the means by which all peoples will be blessed. In chapter 15, Jehovah tells Abram to look up and count the stars if he can. So your offspring will become, God says. Did you know? Genesis sets the theme for the entire Bible. The vindication of Jehovah's right to rule and the fulfillment of his purpose for the earth and mankind by means of his kingdom in the hands of a future offspring. This offspring and his work were first foretold at Genesis 3.15. The book of Revelation shows how that offspring crushes the original serpent, Satan, and brings the promised blessings to all obedient mankind. In chapter 19, God destroys Sodom, Gomorrah, and neighboring cities because of their gross sexual immorality. In chapter 22, Jehovah tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. But when Abraham attempts to do so, Jehovah stops him and reaffirms his earlier promises concerning Abraham's future offspring. Chapters 24 to 50 focus largely on Isaac, his twin sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob's son, Joseph. Isaac blesses Jacob who then goes to distant Padan Aram. There, by means of Leah, Rachel, and their two maidservants, Jacob fathers many children, including eleven sons. Jacob then returns to Canaan, where God changes his name to Israel, and where Rachel gives birth to Jacob's twelfth son. Chapters 37-41 tell how Jacob's 17-year-old son Joseph is sold by his brothers and becomes a slave to Potiphar, a court official of Pharaoh. 
Potiphar's wife later tries to seduce Joseph, but fails. She accuses him of sexual assault, and he is imprisoned. When Joseph is 30 years old and still a prisoner, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams with the help of God's Spirit. As a result, Joseph is set free and appointed Prime Minister of Egypt. In chapters 42 to 47, Joseph is reunited with his family, who settle in Egypt as alien residents. Chapter 49 contains Jacob's deathbed prophecy about his sons. Judah's family line will produce the promised offspring, that is, Shiloh, the one to whom the obedience of the peoples will belong. As you read the book of Genesis, Note how it explains the root cause of mankind's suffering. See how and why the patriarchs gained God's favor and blessing. And read how Jehovah's promises to those men of faith point forward to Jesus Christ, the King of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Exodus Exodus was written by Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in 1512 BCE, a year after the Israelites left Egypt. The book covers a period of 145 years, from Joseph's death in 1657 BCE to the construction of the tabernacle in 1512 BCE. Exodus tells us how Jehovah delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt how he organized them into a nation, and how he taught them how to worship him. Exodus has 40 chapters. In chapter 1, we learn that the Israelites have increased at an extraordinary rate, causing Pharaoh to subject them to harsh slavery. Chapters 2 to 4 relate events around Moses' birth, his adoption by Pharaoh's daughter, and his flight to the land of Midian after killing an Egyptian who was oppressing a Hebrew. Many years later, Jehovah commissions Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. In chapters 7 through 10, Moses, using his brother Aaron as spokesman, repeatedly tells Pharaoh to send Israel away, but Pharaoh refuses to do so. Jehovah responds by bringing ten plagues on Egypt. These include turning the Nile River into blood, covering the land with frogs, and inflicting boils on man and beast. In chapter 12, God institutes the Passover. He also brings the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn. A humiliated Pharaoh, whose son is among the dead, at last tells the Israelites to leave. In chapter 13, by means of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, Jehovah leads his people to freedom. In chapters 14 and 15, Pharaoh foolishly pursues the Israelites, but Jehovah drowns him in the Red Sea along with his military force. Moses and the Israelites then sing a victory song to Jehovah. Did you know? Through Moses, Jehovah told Pharaoh, For this very reason I have kept you in existence, to show you my power, and to have my name declared in all the earth. God's name did become widely known. Even 40 years later, the people of Canaan, including Rahab of Jericho, recalled the events at the Red Sea. More important, Pharaoh's humiliating end serves notice on all who defy Jehovah, including Satan. In chapter 16, Jehovah provides the Israelites with manna, which becomes their main food during their wilderness trek. In chapter 19, Moses ascends Mount Sinai, where God promises that if the Israelites strictly obey him, they will become to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In chapter 20, the people witness thunder and lightning, the sound of a horn, and smoke coming from Mount Sinai, as God gives the Ten Commandments. In chapter 24, 
Moses reads the Book of the Covenant to the people. They respond, All that Jehovah has spoken we are willing to do. Chapters 25-40 to deal largely with the priesthood, the construction of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the lampstand, and other sacred items. Chapters 28 and 29 focus on the attire of the priests and the installation of the priesthood. The high priest's attire includes an ephod and a turban with a golden plate. Engraved on the plate are the words, Holiness belongs to Jehovah. In chapter 32, while Moses is on Mount Sinai, the people make a golden calf and worship it with dancing and singing. When Moses returns, he burns and crushes the idol, scatters the powder on the water, and makes the Israelites drink it. In chapter 34, Moses, again on Mount Sinai, hears Jehovah declare his name and attributes. Chapter 40 tells us that the pillar of cloud covers the completed tabernacle, which fills with God's glory. As you read the book of Exodus, note how Jehovah can humiliate the proud and arrogant. Observe how He uses the humble and meek, and see how His deliverance of Israel strengthens our faith in our future deliverance by means of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Leviticus Leviticus was written by Moses in 1512 BCE in the wilderness of Sinai. The name Leviticus, later given to the book, comes from a Greek word meaning pertaining to the Levites. Yet the book was written not for the Levites alone, but for the entire nation of Israel. Leviticus covers a period of about one month, describing the events immediately following the construction of the tabernacle. Leviticus focuses on Jehovah's holiness and the holiness of his people by their obedience to his statutes. Chapters 1 to 7 set out the various laws about offerings to Jehovah. Chapters 8 and 9 cover the installation of the priesthood, the anointing of Aaron as high priest, and Aaron's first offerings to God. In chapter 10, Jehovah puts to death two of Aaron's sons, the priests Nadab and Abihu, for offering unauthorized fire or incense. Jehovah then issues the command that priests must not drink alcohol before entering the tent of meeting or tabernacle. Chapters 11 to 15 set out laws about cleanness and uncleanness. In regard to food, Jehovah tells the Israelites which creatures they may and may not eat. Instructions regarding the Day of Atonement are given in chapter 16. Chapters 17 to 20 contain laws on holy conduct. For example, God's people must not eat blood or engage in any form of idolatry or spiritism as the nations around them were doing. They should show consideration for the blind the deaf, and the foreign resident, and they should treat the elderly with respect. Did you know? The arrangements mentioned in the book of Leviticus were a shadow of the good things to come, as explained in the book of Hebrews. For example, the high priest typifies Jesus Christ. The blood of the animal sacrifices foreshadows the blood of Jesus. The most holy of the tabernacle represents heaven itself, where Jesus appeared before God on our behalf. Chapters 21 and 22 set out rules for the priesthood. For example, those serving as priests must be sound in body, having no physical defects. Chapters 23 and 24 have instructions about festivals and holy days. Jehovah also provides directions regarding the lamps in the tabernacle and the ring-shaped loaves of showbread. Chapter 24 also highlights the sacredness of God's name. At Jehovah's command, a man who cursed that name is stoned to death. 
Chapter 25 contains laws about the Sabbath year, the Jubilee year, the restoration of property, and the treatment of the poor. Those who are sold into slavery must be treated kindly as hired workers. Chapter 26 spells out the blessings of obedience to Jehovah and the punishments for disobedience. Chapter 27 closes the book of Leviticus with laws about things vowed to Jehovah and things devoted to Him. As you read the book of Leviticus, note how we should strive to be holy in imitation of Jehovah, why we should deeply respect His holy name, and why we can have confidence that the entire earth will reflect God's holiness under the rule of His Son, the great high priest and king of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Numbers Numbers was written by Moses. He began the writing in the wilderness of Sinai and completed it on the plains of Moab. The narrative covers a period of 38 years and 9 months, from 1512 to 1473 BCE, when Moses finished the writing. Numbers gets its name from the two times that Moses numbered the people, first at Mount Sinai and later on the plains of Moab. The book highlights Jehovah's ability to lead His people. It underscores the need to obey God's appointed representatives. And it illustrates the importance of strong faith. Numbers has 36 chapters. In chapters 1 to 4, Israelite males 20 years old and up, except for the Levites, are registered for the army. The Levites are set apart to assist the priests. Chapters 5 to 9 discuss marital faithfulness, quarantining, and service as a Nazarite. In chapter 10, the Israelites pull away from the wilderness of Sinai by their tribal divisions. In chapter 11, the people complain about the manna, a miraculous food provided by Jehovah. In the next chapter, Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses. For this, Miriam is temporarily struck with leprosy and quarantined for seven days. In chapters 13 and 14, Twelve Israelite chieftains, one from each tribe, are sent to spy out the land of Canaan. Ten spies bring back a negative report, and the people want to return to Egypt. For this gross lack of faith, the Israelites must wander in the wilderness for forty years until that generation has died. Did you know? Joshua and Caleb were the only spies who had faith in Jehovah. So they were the only spies who would enter the Promised Land, and they did. Caleb inherited the field and settlements of Hebron. Joshua's inheritance was in the mountainous region of Ephraim, where he died at the age of 110. Chapters 15 to 17 discuss the various offerings for sins, as well as the rebellion and execution of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and their supporters. In chapter 21, the people again complain about the manna, calling it contemptible bread. In chapters 22 to 24, Moabite king Balak hires Balaam, a greedy non-Israelite, to curse Israel. But Jehovah makes Balaam pronounce blessings. In chapter 25, Many of God's people commit sexual immorality with Moabite women. This leads to idolatry and the death of 24,000 Israelites by a scourge from God. In the next chapter, Moses takes the second census. In chapter 27, the daughters of Zelophehad tell Moses that they have no brother to carry on the family inheritance. Jehovah directs that in such situations, a daughter may have that privilege. Then, God commands Moses to ascend a mountain in the region of Abiram to view the Promised Land. Because Moses is soon to die, 
Jehovah tells him to appoint Joshua to lead Israel into Canaan. Chapters 31 to 36 discuss the apportioning of Canaan and other matters as the Israelites prepare to cross the Jordan River. As you read the book of Numbers, note how Jehovah patiently guides his people. See why we need to obey those appointed to take the lead among us and reflect on our need for strong faith as we approach a far greater promised land, the new world under God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Deuteronomy Deuteronomy was written by Moses on the plains of Moab in 1473 BCE, just before the Israelites entered the Promised Land. The name Deuteronomy means second law, or repetition of the law. However, the book is also an explanation of the law. Deuteronomy urges the Israelites to love and obey Jehovah in the land he is about to give them. The book consists primarily of four discourses, a song, and a blessing by Moses. In the first discourse, found in chapters 1 to 4, Moses reviews Israel's history after the Exodus and urges the people to remember what Jehovah has done for them. For example, Moses reminds them that Jehovah eliminated the faithless and cowardly generation that, 40 years earlier, feared the inhabitants of Canaan. In the second discourse, contained in chapters 5 to 26, Moses exhorts the people to obey God's commandments, not out of mere duty, but because they love Him with all their heart, soul, and strength. Did you know? In the ancient world, foreigners often had no legal rights, and widows and fatherless children faced many difficulties. In Israel, however, Jehovah's law applied to and benefited all, including foreigners, widows, and fatherless children. Jehovah loves these individuals, and His people should love them too. In chapter 7, Moses tells the Israelites that Jehovah will clear away the nations in the Promised Land, which are more populous and mightier than Israel. In chapter 8, Moses describes Israel's inheritance as a good land, with streams of water, wheat, barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. But it is a land filled with false worship. So in chapter 12, the Israelites are commanded to pull down the altars to false gods, to shatter the sacred pillars, to burn the sacred poles, and to cut down the graven images. In chapter 16, Moses reminds God's people to celebrate the Passover, as well as the three great festivals, the Festival of Unleavened Bread, the Festival of Weeks, and the Festival of Booths. Chapter 18 contains a prophecy about a future great prophet. Moses says, Jehovah your God will raise up for you from among your brothers a prophet like me. You must listen to him. The third discourse in chapters 27 and 28 sets out the cursings for disobedience and the blessings for obedience. After the nation crosses the Jordan River, the cursings are to be recited on Mount Ebal, where half of the tribes are to stand. The other tribes are to stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people. Chapters 29 and 30 contain Moses' fourth discourse, in which he makes a covenant with the people, telling them to choose life by obeying Jehovah. In chapter 31, Jehovah commissions Joshua as Moses' successor. Joshua should be courageous and strong as he leads the nation into its God-given land. Chapter 32 records the Song of Moses, which powerfully extols God's faithfulness in contrast with the Israelites' unfaithfulness. In chapter 33, we read the blessing that Moses pronounced on the Israelites before his death. 
In the final chapter, Moses ascends Mount Nebo, where he is shown the promised land. Jehovah says, I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over there. Moses then dies at 120 years of age, and Jehovah buries him in a secret location in Moab. As you read the book of Deuteronomy, see how Jehovah blesses those who love him. Note how he withholds his blessing from those who disobey him. And discern how the principles behind God's law are reflected in the teachings of Jesus, the prophet like Moses, who is also the king of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Joshua The Book of Joshua is named after its writer, Joshua the son of Nun, who succeeded Moses as leader of Israel. The book likely covers a period of more than 20 years, starting in 1473 BCE and ending in about 1450 BCE when the book was completed. The book of Joshua can be divided into four sections. Israel's entry into Canaan, the conquest of the land, the apportioning of it to the individual tribes, and Joshua's final exhortations. The book provides valuable lessons on the need for courage, faith, and obedience, especially when God's people face strong enemies. In chapters 1 and 2, Jehovah tells Joshua to be courageous and strong. The Israelites prepare to cross the Jordan River, and Joshua sends out two spies who go to Jericho. The spies go to the home of Rahab, a prostitute. Moved by faith in Jehovah, she hides the spies, thereby disobeying the order of the king. In chapters 3 to 6, Israel miraculously crosses the Jordan River on dry ground, even though the river is at flood stage. The Israelites observe the Passover and begin to eat the produce of the land. Joshua then meets a man with a drawn sword. The man is the prince of Jehovah's army. Through him, Jehovah tells Joshua how to conquer Jericho. Chapters 6 to 12 describe the conquest of the promised land. In chapter 6, Jericho falls. Only Rahab and her father's household are spared. In chapter 7, Achan is exposed for disobediently taking spoil from Jericho. He is put to death along with his family, who no doubt helped to conceal his sin. Did you know? Rahab and Achan provide contrasting lessons in faith and obedience. Though a Canaanite, Rahab was saved because she obeyed the spies and showed courageous faith in Jehovah. Although Achan was a member of God's dedicated nation and witnessed Jehovah bringing down the walls of Jericho, he was put to death because of his disobedience, lack of faith, and greed. In chapter 8, Ai is conquered and reduced to a permanent mound of ruins. Joshua then reads God's law to the people. Half of the nation stands in front of Mount Gerizim, and the other half in front of Mount Ebal. In chapter 9, the Gibeonites trick Joshua into making a covenant with them, and he spares their lives. Chapters 10 to 12 contain a record of some of Israel's God-given victories. God even hurls great hailstones at the Amorites and makes the sun stand still so that Israel can take vengeance on its enemies. In chapters 13 to 22, the Promised Land is apportioned among the tribes of Israel. The tabernacle is set up at Shiloh, and the Israelites select six cities of refuge for the unintentional manslayer. In chapter 22, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh go to their inheritance east of the Jordan. Chapters 23 and 24 contain Joshua's farewell speeches. 
He tells the people to fear Jehovah and serve Him with integrity and faithfulness. Joshua, as well as Aaron's son Eleazar, then die. Also, the Israelites fulfill their sworn oath to bury the bones of Jacob's son Joseph in the Promised Land. As you read the book of Joshua, note how Jehovah blesses faithful and obedient ones. See how He fights for His people, and observe how He fulfills all His promises, thus strengthening our faith in our future inheritance under His glorious kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Judges The Book of Judges was written by the prophet Samuel, who completed it in about 1100 BCE. Judges covers a period of some 330 years, from about 1450 to approximately 1120 BCE. The book primarily discusses the exploits of the judges, whom Jehovah used to deliver His people from oppression. In chapter 1, we read that the Israelites do not drive out all the pagan inhabitants of the land. Instead, they subject some of them to forced labor. In chapter 2, an angel warns the Israelites that because they have not listened to Jehovah, the remaining people of the land will ensnare them in false worship. In chapters 3 to 16, we see that the angel's words begin to be fulfilled after the death of Joshua and his generation. In an often repeated cycle, the Israelites take up false worship. Jehovah abandons them to their foes. The people cry out for help, and Jehovah raises up judges to deliver them. The twelve judges are Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Barak, Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzen, Elon, Abdon, and Samson. Did you know? The judges described in this book were men of faith who led and delivered God's people, recognizing Jehovah as the true leader and deliverer. They were not judges in the legal sense of the word. In chapter 3, Judges Othniel and Ehud deliver the Israelites from servitude to the kings of Mesopotamia and Moab. In chapter 4, a prophetess named Deborah sends for a man of faith named Barak. She tells him that Jehovah will grant him victory over Sisera, the chief of the army of Canaanite king Jabin, who is oppressing Israel. Jehovah gives Sisera's entire army into the hands of Barak. Not so much as one man remains. Sisera himself is executed by a woman named Jael. In chapters 6 to 8, Jehovah uses Judge Gideon and just 300 men to take the lead in delivering Israel from Midianite oppression. Chapters 11 and 12 discuss the exploits of Judge Jephthah. With Jehovah's help, he subdues the Ammonites who, along with the Philistines, had oppressed Israel for 18 years. Chapters 13 to 16 describe the exploits of Judge Samson, a Nazarite to whom Jehovah gives extraordinary physical strength. Samson takes the lead in saving Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. The events in chapters 17 to 21 fit an earlier period of time. In chapter 17, a man in Ephraim named Micah, who has a house of gods, hires a young Levite named Jonathan to serve as his priest. Jonathan, however, is not of the priestly family. In chapter 18, hundreds of Danites who are on their way to conquer land for their tribe make a stop at Micah's house. They steal his gods and take Jonathan to be their priest. In chapters 19 and 20, 
Men of the Benjaminite city of Gibeah commit sex crimes against the concubine of a Levite. The Benjaminites fail to hand over the guilty men, so the other tribes war against Benjamin, almost wiping out the tribe. As you read the book of Judges, note the harm that can come to those who leave Jehovah. Observe how merciful God is when His people repent and cry out to Him for help. And see why we can trust Jehovah, our great judge, to deliver us from all our enemies by means of His kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Ruth the prophet Samuel is believed to be the writer of this book. The book of Ruth was completed about 1090 BCE. The events related cover a period early in the time of the judges. The book takes its name from one of its principal characters, Ruth the Moabitess. The other main characters are Naomi and Boaz. In chapter 1, a famine moves a man named Elimelech to take his family from Bethlehem to the land of Moab. In Moab, Elimelech dies. His sons Malin and Kilian marry the Moabite women Ruth and Orpah. Some ten years later, both sons also die. Naomi, in deep despair, decides to return to Bethlehem. She urges her daughters-in-law to go back to their families. Orpah returns to her people. Ruth, however, sticks loyally to Naomi. When the two widows arrive at Bethlehem, the barley harvest has just begun. In chapter 2, Ruth, by chance, gleans in a field belonging to Boaz, who is related to Naomi's late husband. Recognizing Ruth's fine qualities, Boaz tells her to continue gleaning in his fields. When Ruth later tells Naomi that she had gleaned in the fields of a man named Boaz, Naomi says, The man is related to us. He is one of our repurchasers. In chapter 3, Naomi instructs Ruth to ask Boaz to act as repurchaser. He and Ruth could then raise up offspring for Naomi in order to carry on the family line of Elimelech. Boaz is willing to perform this loving deed, but he tells Ruth that Naomi has a closer male relative who could repurchase her. In chapter 4, Boaz goes to the Bethlehem city gate where he meets with the other male relative, who is referred to as so-and-so. When the relative, in the presence of ten city elders, learns of his obligations, he declines to help. Boaz then publicly accepts the responsibilities of repurchaser. Boaz now marries Ruth, and they have a son, whom the neighbor women name Obed. Did you know? Boaz set a fine example of obedience to Jehovah. He did all in his power to help Naomi and Ruth by applying God's law on repurchase, taking no shortcuts. The book concludes, Obed became father to Jesse, and Jesse became father to David, who became a king of Israel and an ancestor of the Messiah. As you read the book of Ruth, see how Jehovah turns tragedy into triumph. Observe how he rewards those who love and obey him. And note how the book contributes to the history of David's family line, which produced the king of God's kingdom. An Introduction to 1 Samuel In the original Hebrew canon, 1 and 2 Samuel were one volume. The writing is attributed to the prophets Samuel, Gad, and Nathan, Samuel penning the first 24 chapters. 1 Samuel covers a period of just over 100 years, from about 1180 to 1078 BCE, 
roughly when the writing was completed. The book is largely about four leaders in Israel, High Priest Eli, the Prophet Samuel, King Saul, and David. In chapter 1, a barren woman named Hannah begs Jehovah for a son, promising to devote him to God's service. God answers her prayer. When her child Samuel is weaned, she places him in the care of high priest Eli in Shiloh. In chapter 3, Jehovah tells young Samuel to deliver a judgment message against Eli's house because he has failed to rebuke his wicked sons. In chapter 4, Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant at Israel's army camp and slay Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. When 98-year-old Eli hears the news, he falls backward and dies. In chapters 5-7, through seven, the Philistines return the Ark to Israel after suffering a series of heavy punishments from Jehovah. In the next chapter, the Israelites faithlessly demand a king. In chapter 9, Jehovah tells Samuel to anoint Saul of the tribe of Benjamin as leader of Israel. Chapter 11 shows that Saul starts out well, but before long he becomes disobedient. In chapter 13, he presumptuously offers up a burnt sacrifice. In chapter 15, he defeats the Amalekites, but disobediently spares King Agag and the best of the herd and the flock. To obey is better than a sacrifice, Samuel says. He then tells Saul that God has rejected him from being king. In chapter 16, Samuel anoints David, a son of Jesse, to be the next king. In the next chapter, David, with just a sling and a stone, kills the giant Goliath a champion of the Philistines. Chapter 18 records the start of a lifelong friendship between David and Saul's son Jonathan. Seeing David's courage, Saul puts him in charge of the fighting men. David's campaigns are so successful that he receives more praise than Saul, who becomes filled with murderous envy. In chapter 19, David flees for his life, remaining a fugitive until Saul's death. Did you know? 1 Samuel has valuable lessons about faith and obedience. Eli and Saul disobeyed Jehovah and came to a tragic end. Samuel and David, however, served God faithfully from their youth thus enjoying His blessing throughout their lives. In chapters 24 and 26, David has opportunities to kill Saul, but he refuses to harm Jehovah's anointed. In chapter 25, Samuel dies and all Israel mourns. David, now in the wilderness of Paran, sends ten of his young men to a wealthy sheep owner called Nabal to ask for provisions. When Nabal insolently refuses to help, David prepares to take revenge. However, Nabal's wife, Abigail, quickly goes to David with provisions and averts tragedy. In chapter 31, 1 Samuel closes with the death of Saul and three of his sons who are buried under a tamarisk tree in Jabesh-Gilead. As you read 1 Samuel, note how Eli and Saul brought disgrace upon themselves. See why Jehovah loved Samuel and David. And read how God built for David a lasting house, which eventually led to the Messiah, the King of God's kingdom. An Introduction to 2 Samuel In the original Hebrew canon, 1 and 2 Samuel were one volume. 
The prophets Gad and Nathan, who completed the writing of 1 Samuel, wrote all of 2 Samuel. The narrative covers a period of some 37 years, from 1077 to about 1040 BCE, when the writing was completed. 2 Samuel begins shortly after the death of King Saul and concludes just before the death of King David. The book is an intimate and honest account of David's life, as he sought to follow Jehovah with all his heart. In chapter 1, David receives tragic news. Saul and his son Jonathan have died in battle. Deeply grieved, David composes a dirge and calls it the bow. The rest of 2 Samuel can be divided into two sections. Chapters 2-4 to four cover David's kingship over Judah. Chapters 5-24 to 24 cover his rule over all Israel. In chapter 2, David goes to Hebron where he is made king over the tribe of Judah. Meanwhile, Saul's army chief Abner makes Saul's son Ishbosheth king over the other tribes. In chapters 3 and 4, however, Abner and Ishbosheth are put to death, and in the following chapter, the people make David king over all Israel. David then captures the Jebusite stronghold of Zion and moves his capital there from Hebron. Zion becomes known also as the city of David. In chapter 6, David has the Ark of the Covenant brought to Jerusalem. In chapter 7, David tells Nathan that he would like to build a house or temple for Jehovah, but God gives this privilege to a future son of the king. However, out of love for David, Jehovah makes a covenant with him for an everlasting kingdom. Chapters 8 and 10 tell about David's victories over the Amalekites, Moabites, Philistines, and other enemies. Chapter 11 brings us to one of the darkest periods in David's life. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant, and David has her husband Uriah killed in battle. In chapter 12, Nathan, at Jehovah's direction, reproves David. He also says that calamity will befall David's house and that Bathsheba's newborn son will die. Bathsheba, who is now David's wife, becomes pregnant again and gives birth to Solomon. In chapters 13 to 18, the foretold calamities on David's house begin. David's son Absalom conspires to usurp the throne, and David is forced to flee Jerusalem. In chapter 18, David's men defeat Absalom's and Joab puts Absalom to death. Did you know? 2 Samuel powerfully illustrates the Bible's honesty. Even the failings of Israel's great leaders are openly exposed. We also see that truly repentant sinners, while reaping what they have sown, can be forgiven. In chapter 23, David humbly acknowledges, The Spirit of Jehovah spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. In chapter 24, David is incited to register the nation. This bad act angers Jehovah, who brings a scourge on the people. At the prophet Gad's direction, David buys the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite, builds an altar there, and offers up sacrifices to God. At Jehovah's command, the scourge against Israel is halted. As you read 2 Samuel, see how honestly God's prophets recorded Israel's history. Observe how sin can have tragic consequences. And note God's promise to give David a lasting kingdom a promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Son of David and King of God's kingdom. 
An Introduction to 1 Kings 1 and 2 Kings were originally one volume, which was later made into two. Jeremiah is believed to be the writer. 1 Kings continues where 2 Samuel leaves off. The account covers a period of some 129 years, beginning about 1040 BCE with King David's final days and ending in about 911 BCE, when King Jehoshaphat dies. In the first part of the book, after the death of King David, Israel enjoys peace and prosperity under Solomon's rule. In the second part, false worship takes root, and Israel is split into two kingdoms. In chapter 1, Solomon is anointed as king. In chapter 3, Jehovah blesses King Solomon with extraordinary wisdom, along with riches and glory. In chapter 4, God's people prosper under Solomon's rule. Chapters 5 through 8 discuss the construction of the temple, the making of its utensils, and Solomon's dedication prayer. In chapter 10, the Queen of Sheba hears a report about Solomon and then travels to Jerusalem to see him. After observing the king's wisdom and prosperity, she says, Look, I had not been told the half. In chapter 11, Solomon, in disobedience to Jehovah, loved many foreign women. These pagan wives gradually incline Solomon's heart to worship other gods, including Ashtoreth and Milcom. After reigning for forty years, Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam takes the throne. In chapter 12, Rehoboam promises to add to the already heavy burden on the people. Ten tribes revolt and make Jeroboam their king. Rehoboam is left with the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Jeroboam sets up the worship of golden calves to discourage his subjects from worshiping in Jerusalem. Idolatry becomes entrenched in the northern kingdom, and this leads to oppression, power struggles, and assassinations. In chapters 14 and 15, Rehoboam and Abijam after him allow false worship to take root in the southern kingdom. Did you know? About 33 years after Solomon inaugurated the temple, Jehovah allowed Pharaoh Shishak to plunder its treasures. This shows that Jehovah is pleased not by impressive buildings, but by pure worship. In chapter 15, Asa becomes king in Jerusalem, and he does what is right in God's eyes. He is succeeded by his son Jehoshaphat, who imitates his good example. The next chapter mentions a number of wicked kings in the northern kingdom. These include Ahab, who marries the pagan princess Jezebel. She and her husband bring Baal worship into the kingdom. In chapter 18, the prophet Elijah proposes a test on Mount Carmel to show who is the true God, Jehovah or Baal. Jehovah demonstrates that he is the true God. In chapter 19, Elijah flees for his life when he receives a death threat from Jezebel. Jehovah appears to Elijah at Mount Horeb and comforts him in a calm, low voice. He gives Elijah further assignments. In the final chapter, Ahab disregards the prophet Micaiah's warning against fighting Syria. As a result, Ahab is killed in battle. His son Ahaziah takes the throne in Israel. Later, Jehoshaphat also dies, and his son Jehoram becomes king in Judah. As you read 1 Kings, note how false worship leads to great suffering. See how true worship promotes peace and happiness. And take comfort that Solomon's wisdom pales in comparison to that of Jesus Christ the incorruptible king of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Ezra The book was written by Ezra, a priest from the family line of Aaron. 
Ezra was a man of faith who made a diligent study of the Scriptures, and as a priest, had the responsibility to teach God's Word to others. He was also a skilled copyist, a job that required meticulous attention to detail. This thoroughly researched account picks up right where he concluded the book of Second Chronicles, following the Jewish captivity in Babylon. He wrote this book in about 460 BCE in Jerusalem. Did you know? The books of Ezra and Nehemiah were combined on one scroll. Later, though, the scroll was divided into the two books we have in our Bibles today. The book of Ezra contains ten chapters. Chapters 1 through 6 describe the return of a small group of Jews to Jerusalem. In 537 BCE, they rebuilt the altar and celebrated the Festival of Booths, thus ending the 70-year desolation. In the following year, the foundation of the temple was laid. And although opposition halted the work for a time, the house of Jehovah was completed by 515 BCE. In chapters 7 to 10, we jump forward almost 50 years to 468 BCE as Ezra recounts his own perilous journey to Jerusalem. Upon arrival, Ezra was shocked to find that serious sins have taken place among the Jews. He approached Jehovah in public prayer and action was taken to restore the spiritual condition of the people. As you read the book of Ezra, take note of how Jehovah fulfilled His promise to free His people from exile in Babylon and to restore true worship in Jerusalem. Important Steps Leading to the Appearance of the Messiah An Introduction to the Book of Nehemiah Nehemiah was a faithful Jewish man who served in the royal Persian court of Shushan. He had the high-ranking position of cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Sometime after 443 BCE, the book of Nehemiah was written in Jerusalem. It begins by describing events that happened about 12 years after those in Ezra's account. The book contains 13 chapters that cover events that began in 456 BCE to sometime after 443 BCE. However, the first 12 chapters focus on what took place just within the first year. The events in chapters 1 and 2 began to take place near the end of 456 BCE. Men from Jerusalem told Nehemiah about the deplorable condition of the city's walls and gates. Nehemiah prayed to God for direction. In answer to Nehemiah's prayer, the Persian king sent him to Jerusalem as governor and granted him permission to rebuild the walls. Upon arrival, Nehemiah inspected the city walls. He then gathered the people and announced his mission with the words, Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The mission to rebuild Jerusalem marked the beginning of the 70 weeks of years mentioned in Daniel's prophecy. At the end of 69 weeks of years, the Messiah would appear. Chapters 3-6 to six recount the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls and gates despite enemy opposition. Did you know? A large workforce of men and women repaired Jerusalem's walls in just 52 days. Chapters 7-12 to 12 show how Nehemiah and Ezra took the lead in helping the people return to true worship. The people gathered to hear the law being read and explained. Next, the eight-day festival of booths was held. After this, the walls of Jerusalem were inaugurated. Nehemiah continued as governor of Jerusalem for twelve years before returning to his duties under King Artaxerxes. Chapter 13 tells us that Nehemiah traveled to Jerusalem a second time, only to find that the Jews had not kept their promises to Jehovah. He then took decisive action to correct the situation. As you read this stirring account, notice how Jehovah used a Persian king to accomplish his will. Observe how Nehemiah's zeal for and knowledge of God's law led to blessings. 
And note how the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls became a key to understanding an important prophecy in Daniel that pointed to the appearance of the Messiah. An Introduction to the Book of Esther Esther is the second of two Bible books bearing a woman's name. The Jewish woman Esther is featured prominently in the account, which was most likely written by Mordecai, Esther's older cousin. When Esther was orphaned, Mordecai became her guardian. Esther and Mordecai became part of the court of King Ahasuerus. The royal court was in Shushan. The city of Shushan was located in the heart of the Persian Empire, which spanned from India to Ethiopia. The book of Esther records events that began in 493 BCE. It was written about 475 BCE and completed before the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were written. In Esther's day, a small remnant of Jews had already returned to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, but many others still lived throughout the Persian Empire. The book of Esther contains ten chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 record the Persian king's search throughout the empire for a new queen. Esther was finally chosen. Chapters 3 to 7 disclose how Haman, an enemy of God's people, rose to the position of prime minister and hatched a plot to annihilate the Jews. Haman used the king's signet ring to seal a decree ordering the death of all the Jews, including Mordecai. If successful, Haman's plan would have cut off the family line leading to the Messiah. Upon learning of the plot, Esther decided to follow Mordecai's advice and approach King Ahasuerus. Did you know? Appearing before the king unsummoned could have meant a death sentence. Only if the king held out his golden scepter could the offender be spared. Esther courageously approached the king and exposed the wicked plot. Upon learning of it, the king was so furious that he had Haman executed. Chapters 8 to 10 relate how Mordecai is appointed prime minister in place of Haman. Esther and Mordecai enacted a new legal decree, sealed with the king's own signet ring, that authorized the Jews to defend themselves when attacked. The decree was sent throughout the empire. Jehovah gave the Jews a great victory and preserved the family line leading to the Messiah. As you read this book, note how Mordecai and Esther skillfully used the Persian legal system to protect the Jews, how Jehovah can deliver his people out of any situation, and how young Esther courageously risked her life to protect God's people and the family line leading to the Messiah. An Introduction to the Book of Job This book is grouped with four other poetic books, and it is among the oldest books in the Bible. It was completed by Moses about 1473 BCE, toward the end of the Israelites' 40-year trek in the wilderness. The man Job lived in Uz. Shem, a forefather of Abraham, was likely an ancestor of Job as well. Even though Job was not an Israelite, he was a worshiper of Jehovah. Job was very wealthy. He had many servants and owned thousands of sheep, camels, and other livestock. He and his wife had ten children and he was highly respected in his community. However, all of this was lost because of a series of tragic events. At the time Job's trials took place, Jehovah said that there was no one like Job on the earth. Therefore, we can place these events after the death of the faithful man Joseph, but before Moses became leader over Israel. The book of Job contains 42 chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 reveal events that took place in the heavens. Satan challenged Jehovah 
and claimed that Job would not remain faithful when faced with adversity. Chapters 3 to 31 contain several rounds of debates between Job and his three companions, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Eliphaz ridiculed Job's integrity and implied that man is useless to God. Bildad suggested that Job was suffering as punishment for his sins. Zophar harshly insinuated that Job was wicked. Job attempted to defend himself from these accusations, but in doing so, he made incorrect statements about Jehovah. In chapters 32 to 37, after listening to what Job and his companions had to say, the young man Elihu offers wise counsel. Then in chapters 38 to 41, Jehovah, speaking out of a windstorm, corrects Job's thinking with thought-provoking questions about creation. Did you know? The book of Job describes the earth as suspended upon nothing, a fact that was not widely recognized until centuries later. In the final chapter, God commands Job's three companions to offer a sacrifice and tells them that Job will pray in their behalf. Jehovah then restored Job's health and reputation, gave him double the wealth he had before, blessed him with seven more sons and three more daughters, and allowed him to live for an additional 140 years. As you read this book, pay attention to how this account proves that Jehovah is not the cause of human suffering, how events in the heavens help us to understand the issue of universal sovereignty, and how the outcome of Job's trials gives us a glimpse of future kingdom blessings for those who remain loyal to Jehovah. An Introduction to the Book of Psalms Psalms is a compilation of sacred songs, which have been an important feature of true worship that highlight giving praise to Jehovah. In fact, God's name, Jehovah, and a shortened form of it, Jah, appear almost 800 times throughout the book. The writing of the book of Psalms spanned about 1,000 years. Moses is considered to be the earliest composer. The Psalms were compiled after the return of the Jews to Jerusalem from Babylonian exile, apparently by the scribe Ezra. Although Jehovah inspired such men as Solomon, the sons of Korah, the house of Asaph, and others to pen these moving expressions of faith, more than half of the Psalms are attributed to David. The different experiences in David's life provided the background for many of the Psalms. The headings, or superscriptions, found at the beginning of many Psalms, identify the writer and give other information about the Psalm. The book is made up of 150 chapters. It is the largest book of the Bible. The Psalms were compiled into five separate books or volumes. Several themes are developed in these lyrical works. Consider just three of them. Praise to Jehovah is a recurring theme. Many Psalms praise Jehovah for His saving acts. Other psalms praise Jehovah for his creative works, from the marvels of the human body to the earth and seas. Psalm 83 praises Jehovah as the Most High over all the earth. Another theme developed in psalms is that Jehovah helps and comforts those who love him. Jehovah is referred to as the hearer of prayer and as a merciful father who pardons repentant sinners. Psalm 23 describes Jehovah as a loving shepherd who guides, protects, and cares for his people. An additional theme is that Jehovah will transform the earth into a paradise by means of the messianic kingdom. This kingdom will remove all wickedness and bring peace to the earth. Certain psalms are grouped together. 
For example, Psalms 113 to 118 formed the group called the Hillel Psalms. Did you know? It is likely that Jesus and his disciples sang these very psalms after the Lord's evening meal. Psalms 120 to 134 are called the Songs of the Ascents. Many believe these psalms were sung as the Israelites ascended to Jerusalem to attend the three great annual festivals. The last five psalms form a group in which each begins and ends with the words, Praise Jah! An important feature of psalms is that it contains numerous prophecies about the Messiah. Jesus himself said, All the things written about me in the psalms must be fulfilled. As you read the book of Psalms, take note of how it supports Jehovah's sovereignty, how Jehovah helps and comforts those who love him, and how Jehovah will transform the earth into a paradise by means of his messianic kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Ecclesiastes King Solomon, who ruled over Israel from Jerusalem, wrote this book. Ecclesiastes was completed many years into Solomon's reign, 
but before his fall into idolatry. Ecclesiastes contains twelve chapters. In chapter 1, Solomon discusses the futility of human activity. In chapter 2, he looks for meaning in life by evaluating his many pursuits. Solomon writes that pursuing wealth and magnificent accomplishments is like chasing after the wind. Chapters 3 to 6 present observations by Solomon that help us cultivate godly wisdom. He shows that there is an appointed time for everything. He encourages hard work, and he extols the benefits of friendship. He refers to the enjoyment of food and the rejoicing over one's work as the gift of God. Chapters 7 to 11 provide a sobering discussion of life in this world. Solomon observes that life is short and that man needs to use his time, energy, and resources in the best way possible. This will help him make a good name, a reputation with God. Did you know? Solomon alluded to the Earth's water cycle centuries before scientists understood this process. In chapter 12, he encourages young ones to make wise choices before the challenges of old age arrive. Then he sums up all that he discussed with the words, Fear the true God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole obligation of man. As you meditate on the book of Ecclesiastes, note which pursuits are futile and which are worthwhile. How godly wisdom helps us enjoy the gift of life and how cultivating a relationship with God leads to a truly meaningful life under the rule of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Song of Solomon, also known as Canticles. King Solomon wrote this poetic book in Jerusalem. It was composed some time after the temple was built. Of the many songs composed by Solomon, this is considered his greatest. The main character is the Shulamite girl. Other characters included in this drama are the Shulamites' brothers, the shepherd, Solomon, the daughters of Jerusalem or ladies of Solomon's court, and the daughters of Zion or women of Jerusalem. The song is presented through a series of conversations in which the speakers are constantly changing. Although the characters speaking are not named, they can be identified by what they say or what is said to them. The Song of Solomon consists of eight chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 contain events that take place near the town of Shunem, which was also called Shulam. The Shulamite girl is brought into Solomon's camp, but she resists his advances and declares that she can love only her dear shepherd. Did you know? Shunem was the birthplace of David's nurse Abishag and the place where the prophet Elisha often stayed with a family. Chapters 3 to 8 describe events that take place in Jerusalem. Solomon returns to his court taking the Shulamite with him in an effort to impress her. The Shulamite tells the daughters of Jerusalem, or ladies of Solomon's court, not to arouse love in her for Solomon. The shepherd follows the Shulamite to Jerusalem and strengthens her with warm expressions of endearment. We should keep in mind the ancient Eastern setting of this song in order to appreciate the poetic expressions of endearment that may seem unusual today. The shepherd compares the Shulamite's eyes to those of a dove, her hair to a flock of goats, and her cheeks to a segment of pomegranate. Solomon approaches her again with flattering words, but she continues to reject his advances. In chapter 8, the Shulamite girl returns to her home. Having proved her exclusive devotion, she is reunited with her dear shepherd. Their unfailing love is described as the flame of Jah because Jehovah is the originator of true love. 
As you read this book, note the chasteness of the Shulamite girl, her loyalty to the shepherd, and how true love originates with Jehovah, whose sovereignty is based on love. An Introduction to the Book of Isaiah Isaiah served as Jehovah's prophet. He wrote the book bearing his name while stationed in Jerusalem, the capital of the two-tribe kingdom of Judah. Isaiah had two sons, Shir Jashub and Meher Shalah Hashbaz. Their names signified events that would soon affect the kingdom of Judah. Isaiah prophesied for at least 46 years during the reigns of Judean kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He completed the book sometime after 732 BCE. Hosea and Micah recorded their prophecies around the same time. Some of the events foretold by Isaiah were the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, which occurred in Isaiah's lifetime, the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened more than 100 years later. The fall of Babylon, about 200 years after Isaiah's day. And the appearance of the Messiah, which occurred over 700 years after the prophecy was recorded. Did you know? Isaiah's prophecy about the fall of Babylon foretold details such as how the city would fall and even the name of its conqueror, Cyrus. The book of Isaiah contains 66 chapters. The first six chapters are largely warnings about the calamity that was to come upon Jerusalem and Judah for the sinful conduct of their inhabitants. In chapter 6, Isaiah responds to Jehovah's invitation to be his messenger and shows his willing spirit with the words, Here I am, send me. Chapters 7 to 12 deal with the threat of enemy invasion from the combined forces of Syria and the northern ten tribe kingdom of Israel. But in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, Assyria defeated these two nations, removing the threat. Chapters 13 to 23 include pronouncements against Babylon and other nations for their cruelty to God's people. Chapters 24 to 35 contain messages of desolation and of restoration for Jehovah's people. Among their acts of unfaithfulness, the people of Judah turned to Assyria for protection instead of looking to Jehovah. The people of Israel turned to Egypt. In chapters 36 to 39, we read about thrilling events that occurred during King Hezekiah's reign. The Assyrian king Sennacherib invades Judah and threatens to destroy Jerusalem if the city does not surrender. Hezekiah prays to Jehovah for deliverance. Jehovah reassured Hezekiah that Jerusalem would be safe, and then miraculously delivered his people by sending an angel who destroyed 185,000 Assyrian warriors in just one night. Despite this deliverance, Judah's sins would eventually lead to Jerusalem's destruction and the Jews' exile in Babylon. In chapters 40 to 66, Jehovah comforts his people and promises to restore true worship to Jerusalem after they return from exile. You will notice that often Isaiah's prophecy focuses on God's kingdom, in which the Messiah rules and restores true worship forever. Isaiah foretold many details about the Messiah. For example, that he would be born of a virgin, come from the family line of David, reside in Galilee, and cure the sick. Jesus Christ and his apostles quoted Isaiah's prophecy more than any other to make clear the identification of the Messiah. Jesus even read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 in the synagogue in Nazareth and applied the words to himself. As you read the book of Isaiah, note how Jehovah's prophetic judgments always come true. How Jehovah provides salvation for those who trust Him. And how the foretold reign of the Messiah will bring everlasting peace to the earth.
An Introduction to the Book of Lamentations The prophet Jeremiah composed the Book of Lamentations shortly after witnessing the siege and destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon in 607 BCE. Jeremiah expresses deep sadness over the catastrophe that befell Jerusalem. The book is organized into five chapters, or poems. In chapter 1, the city of Jerusalem is described as a princess who is desolated by her enemies and becomes an abandoned widow and slave on account of her many sins. Chapter 2 reveals that it was Jehovah himself who brought about Jerusalem's destruction. Those who pass by its ruined walls are amazed at the complete devastation. In chapter 3, Jeremiah speaks of the desolate nation as an afflicted man who pleads with Jehovah to remember his pitiable and homeless state. However, Jeremiah shows a waiting attitude and expresses hope that Jehovah will, in his loyal love and mercy, restore the nation. Chapter 4 shifts attention to Jehovah's temple. Although it was once the glorious center of true worship, it was now devastated. Jeremiah relates the horrific conditions, deprivation, famine, and death that existed in Jerusalem during its final siege. Did you know? The first four chapters are acrostic poems. In each one, successive verses or groups of verses begin with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 5 is written from the perspective of Jerusalem's former inhabitants who have lost their homes and freedom. Jeremiah likens them to orphans without a father who humbly beg Jehovah for mercy and salvation. As you consider the five poems of Lamentations, notice how rebellion brings divine judgment, how repentance leads to divine mercy, and how sorrow will give way to rejoicing under the rule of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Ezekiel Ezekiel was the son of a priest and served as a prophet of Jehovah. He lived in Judah until 617 BCE when Judean King Jehoiakim was forced to surrender to Babylon. Ezekiel was among the Jewish exiles whom King Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylon at that time. In 613 BCE, Jehovah commissioned Ezekiel to prophesy to the exiled Jews living in Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel faithfully fulfilled his assignment for at least 22 years. He completed his book in about 591 BCE. Ezekiel's prophetic work overlapped that of Obadiah and Jeremiah in Judah and of Daniel in Babylon. The sanctification of Jehovah's name is highlighted throughout the book of Ezekiel. The expression, Sovereign Lord Jehovah, appears 217 times. The book of Ezekiel has 48 chapters. In chapters 1 to 3, we read about the awe-inspiring visions Ezekiel sees by the river Kibar. During an intense windstorm, Ezekiel beholds four magnificent living creatures, or cherubs. Each one has four faces, that of a man, a lion, a bull, and an eagle. These faces reflect attributes that Jehovah possesses. Ezekiel is awed by a vision of the heavenly part of Jehovah's organization, which is represented by a celestial chariot directed by God's Spirit. Chapters 4 to 24 contain Jehovah's judgment against Jerusalem and her rebellious, idolatrous people. Ezekiel often communicated Jehovah's prophecies by means of symbolic actions. For example, Jehovah had Ezekiel engrave the city of Jerusalem on a brick and stage a mock siege against it. As a sign of the coming siege, he laid on his side for 430 days. 
In chapters 25 to 32, Jehovah turns his attention to the surrounding nations. They receive an adverse judgment because of their opposition to his people. Through Ezekiel, Jehovah foretells destruction for the city of Tyre and her king. Did you know? The prophecy against Tyre was fulfilled in two stages. Years after Nebuchadnezzar devastated the mainland city, Alexander the Great completed the destruction by building a causeway to the island city of Tyre, using the rubble remaining from Nebuchadnezzar's conquest. Chapters 33 to 48 contain a message of hope and of the restoration of pure worship. In chapters 40 to 48, we read of Jehovah giving Ezekiel a vision of a temple. This vision of the temple underscores Jehovah's high standards for true worship. As you study this prophetic book, take note of Jehovah's awe-inspiring qualities, Ezekiel's unswerving obedience to his instructions, and Jehovah's promise to unite all mankind in pure worship by means of the kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Daniel Daniel wrote this prophetic book in Babylon. He was taken to Babylon, likely as a young Judean prince, along with other nobles. In time, Daniel served as a government official for the Babylonians and later for the Medo-Persians. Daniel opens his book by relating events that began in 618 BCE when he was still a young man. He completed his writing in approximately 536 BCE. Obadiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah were Daniel's contemporaries. They lived during a tumultuous period of Israel's history that included the destruction of Jerusalem. Daniel witnessed the Medo-Persian conquest of Babylon and the return of a faithful remnant of God's people to Jerusalem. However, he did not join those returning to Jerusalem, likely because of his advanced age. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters. Chapters 1 to 6 record in chronological order the experiences of Daniel and those of his three companions. Chapters 7 to 12 contain Daniel's account of prophetic dreams and visions that he received by inspiration. Chapters 1, 3, and 6 recount the various tests of integrity that Daniel and his Hebrew companions successfully meet. As young men, they reject food and drink that would make them unclean in God's sight. Sometime after this, Daniel's three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bravely face death in a fiery furnace for refusing to worship an image representing the Babylonian state. Years later, Despite an official decree prohibiting petitions to anyone but Darius, Daniel perseveres in prayer to Jehovah and, as a result, is thrown into a lion's pit. With each test, Daniel and his companions maintain their integrity, and Jehovah protects them. Chapters 2 and 4 describe how Jehovah gives Daniel the ability to interpret two of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Each of these divinely sent dreams has prophetic significance. The first dream is of an immense image made of various metals. This image represents successive world powers that have had a major influence on God's people. The prophecy ends with the destruction of these powers and with God's kingdom as the only government ruling over mankind. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream features a tree that reaches to the heavens. It is cut down, and the stump is banded for seven times. This symbolizes an interruption of rulership. However, the stump is allowed to remain, indicating a restoration of rulership. Chapter 5 relates that handwriting miraculously appears on the wall of the palace where Babylonian King Belshazzar holds a feast. Daniel tells Belshazzar that the handwriting warns of the conquest of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians. 
Babylon Falls that very night. Did you know? A large portion of the book of Daniel was written in the Aramaic language. Aramaic was commonly spoken in ancient times, having the same letters in its alphabet as did Hebrew. Chapters 7 and 8 describe the visions Daniel sees of a series of beasts that picture the rise and fall of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Also, Jehovah gives His Son an everlasting kingdom that will replace all human governments. Chapter 9 relates that Daniel discerns from his study of God's written word that the Jews' release from captivity is imminent. Next, we read that while Daniel is praying, an angel appears to him and reveals details concerning the Messiah. Chapters 10 to 12 discuss the event when an angel again visits Daniel, encourages him, and gives him an additional vision of the future. A large part of the prophecy describes a conflict between two kings locked in a struggle for supremacy. The fulfillment of the prophecy would extend to the final part of the days. The angel reassures Daniel of God's approval and tells him that, although he will soon rest in death, he will stand up in the resurrection at the end of the days. As you read this book, note how much Jehovah values Daniel's faithfulness, how Jehovah maneuvers kings and kingdoms according to his purpose, and how Jehovah gives His Son an everlasting kingdom that will replace all human governments.
An Introduction to the Book of Joel Joel prophesied to the two-tribe kingdom of Judah during the 9th century BCE, and he appears to have recorded his prophecies about 820 BCE, in the days of King Uzziah. Joel was a contemporary of the prophets Jonah and Amos. The book contains three chapters, and it warns of the approaching day of Jehovah. Chapters 1 and 2 mention a locust plague that will devastate the land, leaving famine in its wake. The locusts have teeth like those of a lion. They run like horses, scale walls like soldiers, and sound like chariots charging into battle. Although false worship flourishes in Jerusalem and Judah, Jehovah will not let the rebellious conduct of the people continue. Judah's only hope lies in repenting and turning to Jehovah. Did you know? The Apostle Paul quoted Joel when he said, Everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Calling on God's name involves knowing Him, trusting Him, obeying Him, and putting Him first in our life. In chapter 3, the nations are called to account for mistreating God's people. They are to be crushed like grapes in a winepress. Then Jehovah promises future kingdom blessings, both physical and spiritual. In heaven and on earth, all will be united in pure worship. As you study the book of Joel, note how those who make themselves enemies of God fare badly. How different the outcome is for those who repent and return to Him and how Joel's prophecy finds fulfillment in the proclamation of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Amos Amos, the prophet who wrote the book bearing his name, describes himself as having been a herdsman and one who took care of sycamore figs. Amos came from the Judean town of Tekoa, located south of Jerusalem. Jehovah sent Amos as a prophet primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. Amos prophesied sometime within the period from 829 to 804 BCE, during the reign of King Jeroboam II. Amos recorded his prophecy by about 804 BCE, after he returned to Judah. He was a contemporary of the prophets Jonah, Joel, and Hosea. The book of Amos has nine chapters. Chapter 1 contains judgment messages against a number of surrounding nations. Chapter 2 records pronouncements against Moab, Judah, and the northern ten-tribe kingdom of Israel. Chapters 3 to 6 contain a message of judgment against Israel because of the nation's false religious practices and stubborn refusal to accept discipline. Israel has adopted a greedy, materialistic lifestyle. Luxury-loving wives pressure their husbands to defraud the poor and lowly. Chapters 7 and 8 present a series of impressive visions. Amos sees an unstoppable locust swarm and then a destructive fire. Next, a plumb line illustrates how far Israel has deviated from Jehovah's requirements. Finally, a basket of summer fruit signifies that Israel's end is near. Did you know? During a meeting of the first century governing body, James, Jesus' half-brother, quoted from the book of Amos to show that Jehovah would gather kingdom heirs from both Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 9 includes Jehovah's promise to raise up the booth of David referring to the royal line leading to the Messianic Kingdom. As you read the book of Amos, note how Jehovah uses humble people to do important work, how those who put faith in material things and ignore God will not prosper, and how Jehovah foretells the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom.
An Introduction to the Book of Obadiah Obadiah was a prophet of Jehovah. He recorded his prophecy about 607 BCE, after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Obadiah was a contemporary of Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. The book of Obadiah is the shortest book in the Hebrew Scriptures. It has just one chapter. Obadiah conveys a judgment message against the nation of Edom. During the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, the Edomites rejoice at Israel's suffering. Edomites capture fleeing Israelites. They hand them over to the Babylonians and share in taking spoil from the conquered Jews. Did you know? The Edomites were related to the Israelites. They were descendants of Jacob's twin brother Esau. He was given the name Edom, meaning red, after he sold his birthright for some red lentil stew. Obadiah prophesies that the nation of Edom will be plundered at the hands of her former allies. This prophecy begins to be fulfilled when the Babylonians conquer Edom. In time, Edom ceases to exist. In the closing verses, Jehovah promises to restore His people as a unified nation and re-establish true worship in Jerusalem. The book concludes with the statement, The kingship will become Jehovah's, indicating that Jehovah's kingship will stand vindicated forever. As you read Obadiah, note how Jehovah is aware of the persecution His people suffer how Jehovah gives His people hope in times of distress, and how Jehovah's lasting kingship will stand vindicated forever. An Introduction to the Book of Jonah Jehovah assigned the prophet Jonah to deliver a warning to the Assyrian city of Nineveh. Jonah prophesied sometime during the reign of Israel's king Jeroboam II. Jonah wrote the book bearing his name about 844 BCE. This was about 100 years before Assyria took Israel into exile and some 200 years before Nahum foretold the destruction of the Assyrian city of Nineveh. Jonah lived about the time of Amos, who also prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel, and Joel, who prophesied in Judah. The book of Jonah has four chapters. In chapters 1 and 2, we learn of Jonah receiving an assignment from Jehovah to go to Nineveh. Overwhelmed, Jonah evades the assignment by boarding a ship headed for Tarshish. Jehovah causes a terrible storm to come up at sea. Jonah knows that he is responsible for the storm and tells the sailors to throw him overboard. When they do, the storm abates. Jehovah sends a huge fish to swallow Jonah. From inside the fish's belly, Jonah prays to Jehovah, and his prayer is heard. Jehovah then commands the fish and it vomits Jonah out onto dry land. Did you know? Jesus foretold that he would die and be resurrected on the third day. He called this the sign of Jonah the prophet, alluding to Jonah's deliverance from the huge fish. Chapter 3 describes how Jonah carries out his assignment. He preaches the message that Nineveh will soon be overthrown. To Jonah's surprise, however, the Ninevites repent, and Jehovah mercifully spares them. Chapter 4 reveals that instead of rejoicing over the repentance of the Ninevites, Jonah becomes angry. He sets up a shelter outside the city to see what will happen. Jehovah uses a bottle gourd plant and a worm to teach Jonah a valuable lesson in loyal love and mercy. 
As you read the book of Jonah, note how Jonah accepted correction and fulfilled his assignment, how Jehovah displayed loyal love and mercy toward the repentant Ninevites, and how Jesus used Jonah's experience to foretell his own death and resurrection, which opens the way to everlasting life under God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Micah Micah was a prophet from the rural village of Moresheth in Judah. He foretold that devastation would come upon Israel and Judah. Micah's familiarity with rural life is seen in the kind of illustrations he used. He served as a prophet for about 60 years during the reigns of Judean kings Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah and he completed his book in Judah sometime before 717 BCE. Hosea and Isaiah also recorded their prophecies during that time. Although the destruction of Jerusalem foretold by Micah occurred many years after his death, he probably lived to see the destruction of Israel's capital, Samaria. The book of Micah has seven chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 disclose the revolt of Israel and Judah, the injustices committed, including those against women and children, Jehovah's warning that Samaria will become a heap of ruins, and God's promise that His people will return to Jerusalem and be gathered together like sheep in the pen. Chapters 3 to 5 contain Micah's denouncements of the leaders, the prophets, and the priests for their wickedness and greed. As a result, Zion will be plowed like a field and Jerusalem will become heaps of ruins. However, Micah also foretells that in the final part of the days, true worship will be elevated above all false religion and people of all nations will stream to the mountain of the house of Jehovah. Did you know? Jehovah inspired Micah to foretell that Bethlehem Ephrathah would be the birthplace of the Messiah. This was fulfilled when Jesus was born in that town. You can find this prophecy at Micah 5 too. Chapters 6 and 7 highlight the deplorable spiritual condition of the people. As if conducting a legal case, Jehovah requires His people to exercise justice, to cherish loyalty, and to walk in modesty with Him. But merchants ignore God's laws and cheat their brothers with fraudulent weights and scales. Micah also expresses his confidence that Jehovah will hear his pleas for justice and show loyal love toward his people. As you read the book of Micah, notice how Jehovah asks of us only what is reasonable and beneficial, how Micah trusts Jehovah to carry out judgment against the wicked, and how true worship will be restored to an elevated position by means of God's kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Nahum The prophet Nahum was likely living in Judah when he wrote the book bearing his name. Nahum's message focuses primarily on a single theme, the complete destruction of the Assyrian city of Nineveh. Nineveh, known for its violence and brutality, was referred to as the City of Bloodshed. At one time, in response to the judgment message delivered by the prophet Jonah, the inhabitants of Nineveh repented of their wickedness. However, the Ninevites eventually returned to their wicked ways, and about two centuries after Jonah's prophecy, Jehovah used Nahum to prophesy against Nineveh again. The book of Nahum was completed sometime before 632 BCE the year Nineveh was destroyed. Nahum was a contemporary of the prophets Zephaniah and Jeremiah. 
The book of Nahum contains three chapters. In chapter 1, Nahum proclaims Jehovah's judgment against the city of Nineveh. The entire city, with its collection of pagan gods made of wood, stone, and metal, will be completely destroyed. This is good news for the people of Judah. Free from that cruel and dangerous enemy, they can celebrate their festivals in peace. Did you know? We can trace Nineveh's origin back to the days of Nimrod, the founder of the first empire to exist after the flood. Chapters 2 and 3 describe Nineveh's destruction in greater detail. Nineveh was a heavily fortified city with high walls and a moat. But Nahum prophesies that the gates of the rivers will be opened and the palace will be dissolved. These words were fulfilled in 632 BCE when flooding caused damage to the city. This permitted the besieging forces of Babylon and Media to capture the city and destroy it. Jehovah's prophetic word through Nahum came true in every detail. As you read the book of Nahum, consider how Jehovah hates violence, how Jehovah always fulfills His word, and how Jehovah provides comfort for all who seek peace and salvation under His kingdom. An Introduction to the Book of Habakkuk Habakkuk served as a prophet in Judah. From the book's closing notation, To the director, with my stringed instruments, it has been inferred that Habakkuk may have been a temple musician. He wrote the book bearing his name about 628 BCE, some twenty years before the destruction of Jerusalem. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah, who also served in Judah. The book of Habakkuk has three chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 present a dialogue between Habakkuk and Jehovah. The prophet expresses dismay over the violence, oppression, and injustice that are prevalent in Judah. Jehovah declares that soon the Chaldeans will be used to punish the nation of Judah. Jehovah assures Habakkuk that this divine judgment on Judah will not be late, and that the Chaldeans will also be punished later for their own acts of cruelty and wickedness. Did you know? In Habakkuk's day, Jehovah's temple was in Jerusalem, and the Davidic dynasty had ruled uninterrupted from there for over four centuries. Therefore, to the Jews back then, God's allowing the Chaldeans to destroy the holy city was unthinkable. Chapter 3 is a prayer of Habakkuk that is expressed in songs of mourning. Habakkuk recalls past manifestations of Jehovah's power. Although distressed by the conditions around him, the prophet expresses confidence in Jehovah. Habakkuk declares, As for me, I will exult in Jehovah. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. As you read Habakkuk, note how Jehovah is not indifferent to the suffering of his servants, how our confidence in Jehovah's salvation helps us endure with joy, and how Jehovah's judgments by means of his kingdom will not be late. <laughs>